I had the opportunity. There was a, a man there at the church that when I was there, he would come on special occasions. He was married to one of the women in our church, and he would come, and, and God had filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he had been baptized in Jesus' name, but he didn't come regularly, not because he was not spiritual, but because he had grown up in this particular church, not that church, but a, another church there in the city or the area, and had grown up in that church, and his mother, who was up in years, um, still attended that church, and so um, he would take her to church with him. They tried to get her to start attending the, the, the church there, um, uh, uh, Abundant Life, but uh, she was pretty set in her ways. But, but this man was very, very, um, ju just has a, a real heart for the Lord. And I don't know now if his mother has passed away or if uh, she may be in a nursing home or something. But now he is attending uh, the church, Abundant Life, uh, on a regular basis. And I had the, the privilege of being able to speak there and and then just, you know, observe everybody. And there was a lot of new faces, and that was great. But I was able to observe the different ones, and I saw him as he would just stand, and he's a tall man. You can't miss him. But I'd watch him stand and just worship. When others weren't, didn't seem to be, he had, he'd have his hands up, and he was worshiping God. And he was one of the first to come to the front. And, and I've seen him on, on different... Um, uh, Facebook posts or whatever when they'd post the services where he would be up, you know, and actually making announcements or reading scriptures or praying. And it, it just, I, I, I went up to him after service and I, I hugged his neck and I said, you know, it's, it does me good to see you doing how you're doing and, and just worshiping God and, and praising God the way that you are. And, um, his his comment back to me kind of it didn't throw me by any means, but it really made me think. And it it's it, it became the basis of this Sunday school lesson. And he, he said that, you know, Brother Jim, he said, I was reading in the Bible, and I was reading that in heaven only one is seated. The rest are either standing, worshiping God, and that's God himself. The rest are either standing and worshiping him or bowing before him. He said, and I figured if that's the way it's going to be in heaven, I might as well get used to doing it here on earth. So he said, whenever I have an opportunity, he says, I'm going to stand and I'm going to worship him. I'm going to bow before him. I'm going to worship his name. I, I, I'm, I'm going to, to live my life in such a way that is pleasing to God and that is is doing what he has called for us to do, and that is to worship him. In Revelation, the scriptures that he was, was talking about um, was Revelation chapter 4 and uh, verse 2. It says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. And that's where he said, only one was sitting. And then jumping down to verse 9, it says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. His comments to me that morning um, made me stop to think how many times do we just sit there when the, the Spirit of God is moving and we do nothing? You know, people don't realize, but when, when you're sitting up here or in, in the church there, you know, we sat up on the platform and people like where you're sitting don't realize telltale signs that you put off all the time. 
in, in the, the idea that some of you have a white glow on your face, not the Holy Spirit. Okay? It's Facebook or it's your iPad or iPhone and it's amazing. And, and I, trust me, I do have my iPad and I do use it, you know, it, it's a, a whole lot quicker for me to find the scripture when I'm doing it. But, you know, the Lord really was, has been convicting me a little bit lately. And, and this was, this is just a side note. This has nothing to do with my lesson and it wasn't in my lesson. But, you know, the Lord one morning, I was on my way to church and I'd left my Bible at home. And I was just bringing my iPad. And I was bringing it, and the Lord said, you know, because I'll put notes, I'll highlight in that, and I'll do all that kind of stuff. And the Lord said, what happens if you lose that and you don't have that anymore? What if all of a sudden there is no electricity and you can't charge it, and so therefore you can't find what you're doing? If you were to look in my Bible, probably the same with pastors, and I hope a lot of yours, there's probably highlighting, there's underlining, there's notes written, you know, and, and that I can always have. Now, there may come a day also when the government may come and we say, oh, that'll never happen. But there's a lot of things happening today that we always said would never happen. But they may show up and say, we want your Bibles. So therefore, we also have to hide it here. Okay? But anyhow, getting back to off the rabbit trail and, and into my, my thought, you know, there are so many times that we come into the house of God and we may not say it, but we really act like, bless God, God, you're lucky I showed up today. You know, I'm, I, I was tired. And God, I, I just, boy, you're lucky I showed up. And we come in with the superiority complex like God owes us something. And that we need to receive, he ought to be pouring out on us, you know, because he owes us. How many times do we act like or feel like God owes us? Uh, you know, why do we worship him? And as I was doing my studying and stuff, I, I started just jotting down, you know, why do we worship him? Do we worship him to see what we can get from God? You know, if I worship him more, then he owes me more. So therefore, I'm going to worship him because I need more money or I need this or I need that. Do we worship him to feel the goosebumps run up and down our bodies? You know, I, I'm sure we've all, if, if you've gotten the Holy Ghost, you felt those goosebumps. And I love those goosebumps. But is that the only reason I worship him is so I can feel you know, that, that electricity run through my body? Do we worship him because we're told we had to? You know, Pastor Barnett or myself or one of the other ministers gets up and says, you need to worship God. Is that why I'm worshiping him? Is it because it is Sunday and that's what I do on Sundays? I don't do it the rest of the week, but I'm going to show up on Sunday morning and I'm going to worship God. You see... In our lives, because we're humans, a lot of times we do things, right things, for the wrong reason. We desire to do things because we know we ought to do them, and then we end up doing them, but then we end up messing up and not really doing them right. What is true worship? John chapter 9 and verse 31 says, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. We need to understand that in order for God, if, if we're wanting God to, to hear our prayers, and you know, you might say, Well, Brother Jim, you just said, you know, um, is it to see what we get from God? But you know, I want, I want to be seen of God. Not that I am blessed beyond where I'm already at, but I want God 
to receive my praise, to receive my worship, to understand that I love him because he created me. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We need to understand that as we live our lives, as we come into the house of God, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Our lives must be that so that we are truly true worshipers. And that is what I'd like to uh, speak about this morning, is that we are true worshipers. Psalms chapter 96 and verse 9 says, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. I need to come before God with a right spirit, a holy spirit, and if I'm not living right, if I'm not acting right, I need to get right. And that doesn't mean I clean myself up. You know, we don't get God to get good, or we don't get good to get God, we get God to get good. Okay? You know, a lot of us think that, oh, i got to clean myself up, and I've got to do all this. But no, we get God, and then we allow God to work in our lives so that we can become holy. Because the Bible lets us know that God does not dwell where unholiness dwells, where sin dwells. He's not going to bless that. You know, and a lot of people think that as long as I, you know, I come to church on Sunday and as long as I worship God on Sunday morning, I'm good for the week. You're right. You're good for the week. The W-E-A-K week. Because you will not become strong in Jesus Christ if the only time you pray, the only time you read the scripture, the only time you get into doing anything is once on Sundays. You know, we need to have our times of devotion at home, our times of prayer at home, our times of fasting alone. We need to do these things so that we can grow. And then, as we're doing those things, and as we're reading the Word, and we're getting into the Word, let the Word of God and the Spirit of God speak to us, and then answer the call. You see, a lot of times God's telling us, you know, you need to change this in your life or you need to change that. And we think that we don't have to do it. And we argue with God. And we try to push it all aside. And we need to understand that in order to worship God, the Lord in the beauty of holiness, the book of Psalms is filled with hundreds of, of poetic anthems that were used in religious celebrations of Israel that clearly instructed them, and even us today, on how to worship God. And we need, and I'm not going to go into all of them, I mean, really this morning I probably have the shortest list of scriptures to give out today and to use as what I normally do, but I'll tell you this, just open the book of Psalms. Begin to read the book of Psalms and see what David says about worship. See what he says about serving God and living for God. You know, but, but the question comes up, what is worship? What does it mean? Worship is not the slow song sung by the praise team. It's not the amount of money you place in the offering, and it's not volunteering in children's church. Although that, you know, we, we want to get credit for because dealing with the children's church. Speaking of that, I, I, I'm going to kick back here just a quick minute. Friday night we took um, seven. There was a total of seven of, the, of our children from, um, from Apostolic Faith Church that went to Mequon for a children's revival. 
And it was beautiful. It was glorious to watch our children. Our children, I believe, were the last ones at the altar. Our children were there to watch tears running down their eyes. Little Nina, she didn't really know what she was. She, she would get praise in God and, and she was just getting blessed all over and, and she claimed to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But she's there just, just praising God and I'm filming it, you know, or videotape, whatever you want to call it on my phone. And, and, and I'm watching and then all of a sudden she, you know, she would, as long as her eyes were closed, she was just, Oh, she was enraptured in, in, in her praise and worship. And then she'd take and open her eyes and she'd kind of look around and then she'd kind of get quiet and, and kind of turn a little bit to mama. But then all of a sudden, she would shut her eyes again and she would go right back into it because she wasn't getting wrapped up in, in who was around her. And, and, and then all of a sudden, she kind of disappeared. She just kind of finally walked away. And I looked in the, the, the church there. They had steps going up to the platform. And I looked and, and we're kind of like all over here. And I, I look and here's Nina sitting here. Her head is just down. Her eyes are closed. And she's still basking in what God has been doing. So then our kids go over there and they begin praying more with her. But we felt the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost in the children's lives. So yeah, it, it can be a headache sometimes dealing with little kids. But I'll tell you what, it was a blessing. And to hear them singing in the van on the way up and, you know, the, and, and, and the, 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 uh, the evangelist that was speaking to him was telling him how to pray. Raise your hands, kick your head back, close your eyes because you don't want to be watching. And then talk to God in your playground voice. I loved that. Talk to them in your playground. You know how mom and dad say, use your inside voice. You know, just, just be quiet. No, 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 no. When you talk to God, use your playground voice. Just cry out to him. Yell, you know, just, just shout unto the Lord. And these kids ate that up. So therefore they were doing it. All right. Well, I better get back to my, my lesson. Amen. So we know that it's not those things. Uh, these may be acts or expressions of worship, but they do not define what true worship really is. There are numerous definitions of the word worship, yet one definition in particular covers the priority that we should give to worship as a spiritual discipline. And this is found in the Webster Dictionary, 1828. Uh, it says that worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme Submission. Worship is to honor, and here I'm going to insert God, because really we ought to only worship God. You know, I should not be worshiping other people. I shouldn't be worshiping my job. I shouldn't be worshiping my bank account, my, my material goods. Those things are all going to fail me someday. Those things are all going to be gone someday. My worship ought to be to God. So to honor God with extravagant love and extreme submission. You see, as we worship God extravagantly, there is a difference in the way we worship. There is a difference in how we worship. I worship God not to impress Leo. Right? I worship God not to impress, you know, Clarence, who sits, is going to be sitting behind me today. When I'm worshiping God, I'm not doing it so Clarence can be sitting right behind me and saying, oh, wow, Brother, Brother Wasman there is, is really doing a good job. I'm not doing it for that reason. If I'm doing it for that reason, let me let you in on a little secret. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping men. You're trying to get the attention of men. And when I worship, I don't want your attention. I want his attention. I want his attention 
to be upon me and to receive that worship that I'm going to give to him. I want that to be the number one thing. True worship is then defined by the priority that we place on who God is in our lives and where God is on our list of priorities. I remember some years back, most of you probably know how my wife and I met, but I was um, on a, a uh, prior to meeting her, um, I was on a dating website, and it was called Christian Mingle. Okay? And in this, I thought, out of all of these, that one ought to be safe for Christians to be able to find other Christians. And so they would send you the match. Oh, this person matches you, their profile, matches your profile. And I would sit there and I would read their profile. And there were a bunch of different questions in it, you know. Uh, one of them was, how important is God in your life? And it, you know, it, it went from not very to extremely. Well, if they had anything less than extremely, they were done. But then I'd see extremely important in my life. But then one of the other questions a little further down was, how often do you go to church? And it, every time the doors were open, all the way down to once or twice a year, or rarely. Well, what puzzled me was these that would check extremely important in my life, but they would check very rarely going to church. They, they, some of the other ones were, do you drink? No. Do you smoke? No. But then in their pictures, their profile pictures showed them sitting at a bar with a cigarette in their hand. You see, our lives, we can say what we want to say. I can pretend in front of Paul Sanders and get him to believe that I am doing and living a certain kind of lifestyle, but God knows everything. God sees everything. You know, this, this website matched me up with a few people, few women that I happen to know from the local area that used to attend my church. And I knew good and well what they had in their profile wasn't them at all. I decided that wasn't for me and I got out of it. But, you know, uh, we need to understand that our lifestyle the way we live and what and who we worship ought to be only God and with extravagance and, and, and just complete extreme submission. We need to show God true worship and not this, I, okay, I'm at Sunday school now or I'm at the Sunday morning service and so therefore I'll praise God now but the rest of the week, I don't even think about it. Amen? <clears throat> True worship is a matter of the heart expressed through a lifestyle of holiness. True worship is a matter of the heart expressed through a lifestyle of holiness. In our lives, we must be holy. We've already kind of covered that a little bit. But it, we need to be holy. Our lifestyle should express the beauty of holiness through an ex uh, uh, extravagant or exaggerated love for God. Love, or excuse me, if we do not live in extreme or excessive submission to God, then we need to make worship a non-negotiable priority in our lives. You know, as a Christian, if somebody were to come up to me and say, you, you can be a Christian, but you don't have to worship God. How can you do that? I mean, how 
can you do that? If God is truly your God, and you see God as being your creator, and everything that you have comes from him, how can you not worship him? You know, we in our lifestyle show others where our priorities really are. You know, there's the old question, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would they have enough evidence to convict you? You know, I want them to have enough evidence to convict me. Brother Leo, I don't want them coming to and saying, oh yeah, but I, I saw you do this. And I saw you do that. And yeah, I, I know you go to, to church on Sunday, but there's a lot of people that go to church on Sunday. You know, it's to them it's more like a country club. It's for fellowship. They go to see others. They're not going to see God. So that's why I tell you I love seeing you all on Sunday morning. I love seeing you anytime the church doors are open and we're here to worship God. Glad you're here. But you're not the reason I came. I came to worship and to praise Him. By the way, just to let you all know, Thursday night, last Thursday night, was our first corporate prayer meeting at 7 o'clock from 7 to 8. If you weren't here, you missed it. We had about 24 people here. And the power of God was so sweet and beautiful in this house. I want to encourage everybody, if you can at all make it on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, be here for corporate prayer. It is a beautiful time of worship and praise and prayer. Amen. We worship God because he is God. We worship God because he is God and for no other reason. I, I, I've told you this. I've had a person, I've actually had more than one person, I've heard more than one per person say it, but I literally had one person say it to my face that they said, God doesn't care how I live. He just wants me to be happy. That is not the truth. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God does care how you live. God does want you to be holy. But some of the side effects that we get are blessings that God just pours out upon us, but not because we deserve them but because he's a loving God. But we worship God because he is God. The, the way in which we worship God flows out of the reality that God loved us first. God loved you and God loved me before we ever loved him. Before we ever, even in our finite minds realize there was a God. And I know you could go around and there's atheists that'll try to tell you there is no God, but I'm not getting into all that. But I feel sorry for them. Because one day they're going to find that there is a God. And I just pray that it's before it's too late. It is, it is only reasonable that we should thank God for the things that he has done for us. We... Uh, need to get away from the idea that in some way we deserve the blessings of God. Worship is shallow if it is solely an acknowledgement of God's wealth. You know, there are those that, that look at God as their rich uncle, their proverbial rich uncle or their rich daddy. He's got it all anyhow, so he might as well pass it on to me. 
You know, there are people that live for God, and I say that in quotations, I say that very loosely. They live for God just to see what they can get from God. If God were to stop blessing you today, if God were to stop providing extra blessings on you, allowed you to still live, because really, the very breath that you, are, that you breathe, every second, every heartbeat that you have, every ability to be able to see, taste, hear, those are all blessings from God. But let's just say he just cut back to you being able to survive, but he didn't pour out the extra blessing. Would you still worship him? You know, and, and, and I'm glad to see heads nod, and I'm glad to hear mm -hmm's and, and all that. But I'm going to tell you something. It's easy when somebody asks you the question right to your face. You go, oh yeah, I would. But then when you feel like God has abandoned you, because that's what I'm telling you. If God were to quit blessing you with the extracurricular or those, those extra blessings, and you basically don't really feel him moving in your life, you feel like he's abandoned you. Do you really feel like worshiping him? Yeah, Brother Mike, it's hard. You know, those are the times we need to worship him more. Those are the times that we need to say, you know what, God? I don't know what's going on. I really, really am having a hard time here. But God, because I know you're God, and I know you created me, and I know you see everything that I do and everything I'm going through, even though, God, I don't really feel you right now, I'm going to worship you. Because, God, I'm not going to worship you out of feeling. I'm going to worship you because of who you are. You know, we need to worship him because of who he is. Amen? Worship is shallow if it is solely an acknowledgement of God's wealth. Psalms chapter 96 Verses 5 and 6 says this, For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Our worship must be towards the one who is worthy simply because of his identity as the omnipotent, omniscient, an omnipresent one, and not just because God is wealthy and able to meet our needs and answer our prayers. You know, as we live our lives, we ought to live our lives in a spirit of worship. You know, I'm not saying that there's not times that we go through hard times, heartaches, struggles, you know, we don't know where the next meal may be coming from. I don't know. The car broke down. The kids are sick. You have no money to pay the doctor's bill. You know, rent is due. No gas, you know, whatever. But I still praise you, God. I, I don't understand why this is all happening. But God, I'm going to still praise you. Because I'm not worshiping you for what I can get out of it. But I'm going to worship you because of who you are. Our worship must be on the, the worthiness of God and not on his wealthiness. We ought to worship him on the worthiness of God and not on his wealthiness. I, I kind of touched on this already, but... It, would you continue to worship God if from this day forward God's miraculous signs and wonders were not so profoundly evident in your life? 
Would God still be worthy of your worship? Or is your worship completely dependent upon the abundance of God's blessings upon your life? Do you only worship God for what he can do for you? There are many people that worship God and, and think of God as nothing more than a genie in a bottle. They think that God is there strictly to pour out blessings upon them. After all, he's got it. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. So he's got more than enough. So therefore, just pour it out, God. I deserve it. Let me ask you a question. Why? Would you feel that you even deserve one ounce of a blessing from God? What have we done to deserve any blessing? Just the fact that, you, and, and we might say, well, uh, I'm, I, I'm a witness, I, I, I'm a disciple leader, I, I, I tell others about Jesus and, and all of that. That's just what we owe him to begin with, just for the fact that he saved our soul, just for the fact that he created us. We owe him all of that. He doesn't owe us anything above and beyond, but because God is God and he is so gracious, he does bless us with these things. Amen. This is the promise that when we worship God with extravagant love and extreme submission, God will come and commune with us. The promise is not that we will feel great or that our heavy load will be lifted, but that God will come. You know, as we pray, as we seek God, I have heard people tell me to my face, and I probably thought this myself, well, I prayed and God didn't answer. I needed this and God didn't answer. I needed that and God didn't answer. So therefore, God can't be real. But you know, the truth of the matter is, God answered. You just weren't listening. He may have answered in a way that you didn't want to hear. He may have answered and given you something that you just really didn't like. So therefore, in our minds, in our human nature, we say, because God didn't give me the answer I wanted, he didn't answer. Because God chose to answer in a different way, therefore God didn't answer. But we need to realize God is there and he does want to commune with us. And when we worship him, he will come. And when God comes in his own time as a response to our, uh, our worship, Psalms 96, 13 declares, let all creation rejoice before the Lord for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. In his faithfulness. Oh, the beauty of the faithfulness of God. I want to be found faithful. But in my humanity, I mess up sometimes. Because we're human, we make our mistakes. Because, you know, and, and, but in his faithfulness, he never makes a mistake. In his faithfulness, everything is right. Everything is true. You know, people say, well, you know, God, God doesn't, you know, didn't do enough for me. What do you mean he didn't do enough for you? He came to this earth. He lived. He died upon a cross, rose again, shed his blood, rose again. So that you could live forever with him. What more can he do? Force it down your throat? It's a gift. You must receive it. And ask 
for his strength in your life. In other words, when we worship God, he will inspect our hearts first, and then the other benefits that we tend to expect because we raise our hands and shout with our voices are worthless if our hearts are not right with God. You know, I often wonder, there's a lot of people in the world that have no time for God. They're into their sports, and they're into their lives, and, you know, and, and church and God has little time for them. Oh, maybe some of them even show up to church once on Sunday. And if the preacher preaches one minute past a certain time, they get up and walk out the door because they got other things that they've got to do. But those same people, if a football game goes into overtime, they'll be right there. And they'll be watching. And they'll be, you know, come on. Uh, Pastor, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't come to church because it's too cold. The church house is too cold. But they'll go out to a football game and sit in knee-deep snow with a wind chill of minus 20 to cheer on guys that did absolutely nothing for them. Oh, I, I can't come, Pastor, because the church house is too hot. But they'll work out in their backyard in 100-degree weather, sweating profusely so they can make their house pretty for a building that has done absolutely nothing for them but take their money and, yeah, maybe provide a, a roof over their heads. But they'll do that. Pastor, I, I, I can't come to church because services are too long. I got to get home. I got to get the kids to bed. I got to, you know, I, I remember growing up, coming to church. I, back then, these weren't cushioned. They were hard wood. Some of you remember them. I remember falling asleep on those as a small child. I remember even one time being left on them when my parents went home. They had to come back and pick me up. Thank God I was still sound asleep, but I, they told me, oh yeah, we left you a few last night, sorry. You see, you know, I remember, but I, I also remember, and I was talking with my father not too long ago, my wife and I were talking with him, I remember we, would, we couldn't start vacation until Monday morning because we had church Sunday morning and Sunday night. Where all my friends, their vacation started Saturday morning. And they'd leave Saturday morning, be gone Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We left on Monday morning and we were back by Saturday night. You know why? Because we had church on Sunday. And if it just so happened that we were going to be out of town for two weeks, guess what? They had found a church somewhere to be in on Sunday. And I just, I remember, moment of truth, I remember thinking to myself, when I grow up and I have kids, I will never be that way. Our vacation is going to start Saturday morning, and we will go all the way until Sunday night. Ask my kids if that worked. I couldn't do it. The way I was raised is church came first. The house of God came first. My worship came first. If, I'm, if that meant I had to fall asleep on the pew and then sleep in the car on the way home and, and dad had to carry me or he had to shake me and say, okay, Jim, get up, let's go. It's time to get in the house, get to bed. That's what we did. But I had such a heart for, for God by the time I, I, I you know, when God started calling me at, I believe, about the age of 11 or 12 years old, to the ministry. And I wish I could say from that point on, I lived strong for God, but there was a time there where I wasn't living for God the way I ought to. But God kept talking. God kept calling. God kept drawing me to Him because of the way that, that you know, my parents put into me. Church, let me explain something to you. 
You've got to get your children involved in the house of God and in the work of God. You've got to say, listen, this is where we're at. You know, I remember, you know, company might come over on Sunday. Hey, we leave at this time to go to church. So you can come with us or you can wait here or you can go home, whatever you want to do. But we're going. You know, and, and I was I was sharing this with my wife, and I said, you know, part of the funny part about it all was, you know, I couldn't tell my dad, Dad, I'm sick. Unless I was running a high fever and basically projectile vomiting. Oh, Jim, you're not feeling good? Best place for you to be is in the house of God. We'll have you prayed for. You know, that is the way... We raise our kids, but we teach them to worship. Amen. We teach them to um, worship God. The promise of worship is that we can be transformed into God's likeness because he will reveal the truth about the condition of our hearts as we worship him. Amen. Worship is having an extravagant or exaggerated love for God, and if your life is not lived in extreme or excessive submission to Him, then you need to make worship a non-negotiable. I think I already did that one. Amen. So evaluate your expressions of worship so that you will do as Psalms chapter 96 and verse 8 says, Give to the Lord the glory do His name. Um. Bring an offering and come into his courts. It says that we, that God is due, give to the Lord the glory that is due his name. It's due him. In other words, we're responsible to give it to him. When we worship God in this way, we will find that he will come and commune with us. He will respond to our worship by making our hearts more like his heart. Amen. And it all starts in worship. So this morning, when we begin singing and, and doing the pre-service part or pre-preaching, we need to worship him. Not for what God is going to give us, but just for who God is. God, I worship you. I praise you because you've done so much. I don't deserve any of it, God. But I just want to worship you because you are God. Amen?